estoy también eh, muy, muy, pero muy contenta de poderles presentar a nuestro conferenciante inaugural, que pues estoy segura que todos lo conocen, es un privilegio tenerlo aquí. Eh, por quien tenga dudas, sino que de la trayectoria de Hall es crítico, académico, su ensayo de Crux of Minimalism, eh, publicado en su libro El retorno de lo real, es un trabajo seminal sobre el tema del minimalismo, es autor de varios libros que incluyen Richard Serra, Compulsive Beauty, eh, Vision and Visuality, Discussions in Contemporary Culture, y editor de The Anti-Aesthetic, Essays on Postmodern Culture. Foster ha sido editor también en numerosas publicaciones periódicas como October, Zone Magazine, Night Critics, Art in America, Art Forum, en fin. Eh, podría estar todo el día diciéndoles todo lo que ha editado, escrito, publicado. Es autor de numerosos artículos y ensayos, ya ha recibido múltiples honores académicos. El trabajo de Foster vincula brillantemente los dominios de la práctica artística y de la crítica académica. Actual, actualmente ostenta la Plaza Townsend Martin como profesor de arte moderno en la Universidad de Princeton. Y de verdad, de verdad, es un gran, gran privilegio y gusto tenerlo aquí con nosotros para, para abrir la discusión. Welcome, Juan. Thank you. Gracias. Buenos días. Muchas gracias. I'm sorry that I will speak in English. Very sorry. It is great to be in Mexico City. I've always wanted to see your extraordinary city. Uh, I, I wish to, to thank uh, the sponsors, Pop, I want to thank Isa and her terrific staff, especially uh, Mariana. As the initial speaker, I want to offer an overview of some contemporary art that might have resistant qualities. But what is resistance in art? For the most part, uh, I will leave this difficult question to my fellow speakers, if they don't mind. But briefly and personally, I see resistance in relation to an old idea of the avant-garde, the modernist avant-garde. A guard, a group of experimental artists that are in advance, in advance of the art academy, but also, of course, of bourgeois society, of its culture. This is an avant-garde modeled at times and in part on the vanguard party, a revolutionary party on the left. This modernist avant-garde, this is very general, I have in mind expressionism, data, surrealism, constructivism, and so on. This avant-garde resisted by means of transgressive advances. As you know, they were driven by, by many different forces, by political revolution, technological transformation, new ideas of subjectivity, especially Freud, new ideas of society, especially Marx. This, this old model of the avant-garde functioned in the post-war period too, period after World War II, in the neo-avant-gardes of the 1950s and 60s. But this model is less pertinent, I think, after 1968. That is when the model of resistance becomes more and more important. This model is fashioned in part on the new political movements of the time. Anti-colonial, civil rights, student, feminist. Movements that resisted the dominant social order, order that was colonial, perhaps racist, certainly patriarchal. This art did not want to advance this culture from space beyond, as in the old model of the avant-garde. It sought to resist this order from within. And this, for me, is the most important distinction from the old avant-garde. Art of resistance assumes a position of, of imminent critique, of critique from within. 
Now, this definition is very, very general, I know. But the term resistance is made specific and made various in different moments and places. Resistance is always time and site specific. In one place, its main target, its main object might be the state. In another place, the mass media. In another place, again, the market, and so on. Again, for resistance to be resistant, it must be specific. It must articulate its specificity. I like the definition of my colleague here, Giuseppe Catella. You will hear him later today. The definition of resistance is the articulation of difference. It's more modest than other associations of the word opposition, for example. And resistance, I just want to add, is not only negative. Again, I think for an art of resistance to be effective, it must produce desire, and it must draw on hope. For example, as you will see tomorrow, the artist Thomas Hirschhorn practices resistance in part through expressions of love. Okay, on to my lecture, which is titled Archives and Utopias in Contemporary Art. Uh, it is a brief survey of, of two or three tendencies in contemporary art with political, perhaps resistant ambitions. One tendency is what the, the French curator Nicolo, Nicola uh, Burio calls relational aesthetics. When I do this, it's a quotation. Okay, it's not a, it's not a prayer. <laughs> the other tendency is, is what I will call the archival impulse, the use of archives. I wonder, if we the lights down? Is that possible? <laughs> um, Okay. Okay. In an art gallery over the last decade, you might have seen one of the following. A room empty except for a, a mound of identical candies wrapped in brilliant foils. The first slide. Be a little bit darker still. <coughs> A mound of identical candies wrapped in brilliant foils, candies free for the taking. Or a space where the office contents are dumped into the exhibition area. A couple of pots of Thai food are on offer to visitors who might be puzzled enough to linger, eat, and talk. Or a scattering of bulletin boards, drawing tables, and discussion platforms, some dotted with information about historical figures, as though a documentary script were in the making, or a history seminar had just let out. Or finally, an altar, a monument, or a kiosk cobbled together out of plastic, cardboard, and tape. Next slide. And filled like a homemade <laughs> steady shrine with images and text devoted to a particular artist, writer, or philosopher. Here, Robert Walzer. Such works, which exist somewhere between a public installation and a private archive, can also be found in non-art spaces which might render them even more difficult to decipher in aesthetic terms. Nonetheless, they can be taken to indicate a turn in recent art. In play in the first two examples, such as the, the first image that you saw, is by a work by the Cuban-American Felix Gonzalez Torres, is a notion of art as an ephemeral offering a precarious gift, 
as opposed to a, a painting or sculpture. And in the second two instances, such as the work uh, here, by the Swiss Thomas Hirschhorn, it's a notion of, of art as a passionate probing into a specific figure or event in history or politics, fiction or philosophy. Although each type of work can be associated with a theoretical pedigree, the gift is seen by the, the French anthropologist Marcel Mauss in the first case, or a discursive practice according to the French philosopher Michel Foucault in the second. The abstract concept, the abstract theory, <coughs> is transformed into a literal space of operations, a pragmatic way of making and showing, of talking and being. This way of working is, is not altogether new. Its prominent practitioners, and again, this is a, a wide range of work, very various, very different. Its prominent practitioners who also include the Mexican Gabriel Orozco, the Scott Douglas Gordon, the French Pierre Huig and Philippe Preno, and the American Rene Green and Mark Dion draw on a wide range of artistic precedents. The performative objects of Fluxus artists and the Brazilian neo-concretists, the humble materials of the Italian Arte Provera, and the everyday objects of the French Nouveau Realisme, as well as the site-specific strategies of institution critical art, such as the work of the Belgian Marcel Brotars and the German-American Hans Hacke. But these artists, these contemporary artists, have also transformed the familiar devices of the ready-made object, the found image, and the installation format. For example, some of these artists now treat entire television shows and Hollywood films with so many found images. For example, Douglas Gordon has adapted a couple of Hitchcock films in drastic ways. Maybe the next slide. This 24-hour psycho slows down the original movie to the near catatonic time, running time, announced in the title. For Gordon, such pieces are time ready-mades. That is, given narratives to be sampled in large image projections. The image projection, as you know, is a pervasive medium in contemporary art. While Nicolas Burio, co-director of the Palais de Tokyo, a Paris museum devoted to contemporary art, champions such work under the rubric of post-production. This term underscores the secondary manipulations editing, special effects, and so on, that are almost as pronounced in this art as in film. It also, this, this term, post-production, also suggests a changed status of the work of art in an age of information, which is said to follow the age of production. This new age of information is an ideological assumption, of course, and sometimes, in a world of shareware, information does appear as an ultimate ready-made, as data to be reprocessed and sent on. And some of these artists work accordingly to inventory and select, to use and download, as Burio says, to revise not only found images and texts, but also given forms of exhibition and distribution. Now, one result of this way of working, this mode of art, is a promiscuity of installations in which the old postmodernist complications of artistic originality and authorship are pushed beyond the limit. Consider a collaborative work in progress like 
No ghost, just a shell, directed by Pierre Weave and Philippe Paeno. A few, year, a few years ago, they learned that a Japanese animation company wanted to sell some of its minor characters. They bought one such person, Sai, a girl named Anne Lee, and invited other artists to deploy her in their own work. Here the art piece became a, a chain of pieces. For Huig and Pereno, no ghost, just a shell, is a dynamic structure that produces forms that are part of it. It is also the story of a community that finds itself in an image. If this collaboration doesn't make you a little nervous, consider another group project that adapts another ready-made product. Here, Gillick, Turbanesia, and others will show you how to customize your own coffin from IKEA furniture. The work is titled, How to Kill Yourself Any Anywhere in the World for Under $399. The tradition of ready-made objects from Marcel Duchamp to Damien Hirst often mock mocks high art or mass culture or both. In these examples, it is mordant, it is biting about global capitalism as well. Still, the prevalent sensibility of the new work tends to be more innocent, even playful. Again, an offering to other people and or an opening to other discourses. At times, a benign image of globalization is advanced. And globalization is, of course, one of the preconditions of this very international group of artists. And there are utopian moments as well. For example, Terebanesia, Terebanesia has organized a massive artist-run space called the land in rural Thailand that is designed as a collective for social engagement. More modestly, these artists aim to fashion passive viewers into a temporary community of active discussants. In this regard, Hirschhorn, who once worked in a communist collective of graphic designers, sees his makeshift projects dedicated to artists and philosophers. On the next slide. Sorry, the slides are a little hard. Uh, the next slide again, please. He sees these projects dedicated to artists and philosophers as a species, as a kind of passionate pedagogy. And they do partake of the agit prop kiosks of Russian constructivists like Elizitsky and Gustav Klusis, as well as the obsessive constructions of the Dadaist Kirch fitters. But this altars in particular, but also with this monuments and kiosks, Kirchhoff seeks to distribute, distribute ideas, to radiate energy, and to liberate activity all at once. He wants, he seeks, not only to familiarize his audience with an alternative public culture, but to libidinize this relationship as well, that is, to charge it with passion. Other artists, some of whom were trained as scientists or architects, adapt a model of collaborative research and experiment closer to the science laboratory or the architecture firm than the traditional artist studio. I take the word studio liter literally, Orozco says, not as a space of production, but as a time of knowledge. Promiscuity of collaborations is also meant a uh, pr promiscuity of installations. Next slide, please. 
This is a, an installation in the early 1990s by the American artist Mark Duran. Next slide, please. Another installation um, from 10 years or so ago by the American artist Renee Green. Installation, again, as most of you know, is a, is a common format. An exhibition is a common medium of much art today. Often, entire exhibitions, especially large international shows, are given over to messy juxtapositions of projects, photos and texts, images and objects, videos and screens. And occasionally, the effects are more chaotic than communicative. In these instances, legibility as art is sometimes sacrificed without great gain in other kinds of literacy. Literacy about politics, society, and so forth. Nonetheless, discursivity and sociability are central concerns of the new work, both in its making and in its viewing. Discussion has become an important moment in the constitution of a project, Hui comments, while Tirabhanisha associates his art as a place of socialization with a village market or a dance floor. I make art, Douglas Gordon adds, so that I can go to the bar and talk about it. Apparently, if one model of the old avant-garde was the party a la Lenin, the Bolshevik, today the equivalent might be a party a la Lenin, the Beatle. Well, <laughs> oh well. I'm sorry, there are very few jokes in this. So you have to uh, take your occasion to laugh if you can. Um, Anyway, in this time of, of mega exhibitions, the artist often doubles as a curator. I am the head of a team, a coach, a producer, an organizer, a representative, a cheerleader, a host of the party, a captain of the boat, Orozco comments. In short, an activist, an activator, an incubator. This rise of the artist as curator is complemented by the rise of the curator as artist. This, I think, is a little problematic. Maestros of large shows have become very prominent over the last decade. Often the two groups, artists and curators, share models of working as well as terms of description. For example, several years ago, Pierre Vanisha, Orozco, and other artists began to speak of projects as platforms and stations, as places that gather and then disperse, in order to underscore the casual communities that they sought to create. In 2002, Documenta 11, curated by an international team led by the Nigerian Okwi Emuzor, was also conceived in terms of platforms of discussion scattered around the world on such topics as democracy unrealized, processes of truth and reconciliation, creolite and creolization in four African cities. The actual exhibition in Castle Germany was only the final such platform. And this past year, the Venice Biennale, curated by another international group headed by the Italian Cisco Bonami, featured sections titled Utopia Station and Zone of Urgency, both of which exemplify the informal discursivity of much art making and art curating today. Like kiosk, platform, and station, call up the old modernist ambition to modernize culture in accordance with industrial society. Lizitsky spoke of his constructivist designs as way stations between art and architecture. 
Yet today, these terms also evoke the electronic network, and many artists and curators do use the internet rhetoric of interactivity, though the means applied to this end are usually far more funky than face-to-face -face than any chat room on the web. Along with the emphasis on discursivity and sociability, concern with the ethical and the everyday is often voiced by these artists and curators. Art is a way to explore other possibilities of exchange, says we. It is a model of living well, Tiruvanisha comments. A means of being together in the everyday, Araska remarks. Henceforth, Burio declares, the group is pitted against the mass, neighborliness against propaganda, low-tech against high-tech, and the tactile against the visual. And above all, the everyday now turns out to be much more fertile terrain than pop culture. Now, these possibilities of what Murillo calls relational aesthetics seem clear or clear enough, but I think there are also problems here. Sometimes politics, resistant politics, are ascribed to the art on a shaky analogy between an open work and an inclusive society, as if a, a disorganized form might evoke a democratic community, or a non-hierarchical installation might predict an egalitarian world. Hirshhorn sees his projects as never-ending construction sites, while Tiruvanisha rejects the need to fix a moment where everything is complete. But surely one service art can still render us is to make a stop, take a stand in a concrete register that constellates the aesthetic, the cognitive, and the critical. I don't mean to suggest that these artists don't make a stand. Yeah, I think Hirshhorn often does. But there's a tendency, I think, to make an analogy between uh, loose form, inclusive form, and, and loose, a loose, inclusive society. Moreover, formlessness in society might be a condition to resist rather than to celebrate in art, a condition to make over into form for purposes of reflection purposes of critique. The artists in question frequently cite the situationists, but as the English art historian T.J. Clark has stressed, the situationists valued precise intervention and rigorous organization above all other things. The question, Puig argues, is less what than to whom. Art becomes a question of Dress. Burio also sees art as an ensemble of units to be reactivated by the beholder manipulator. In many ways, this approach is another legacy of the Duchampian tradition. But when is such reactivation too great a burden to place on the viewer? As with previous attempts to involve the audience directly, in some conceptual art, for example, there is a risk of illegibility here. Sometimes the very desire to be transparent uh, renders the art more opaque. And this might return the artist as the principal figure and the primary interpreter of the work. At times, it must be admitted now, the death of the author has meant not the birth of the reader, as the great French critic Roland Barthes speculated after Duchamp, so much as the confusion of the viewer. Moreover, when has art not involved discursivity and sociability, at least since the Renaissance? It's a, a question of degree, of course, but might this emphasis be somewhat redundant? It might 
risk a formalism of discursivity and sociability pursued for their own sakes. Collaboration, too, is often regarded as a good in itself, almost an end in itself. Collaboration is the answer, uh, Hans Ulrich Oberst remarks at one point, as a curator as well. Collaboration is the answer, but what is the question? Art collectives in the recent past, such as those formed around AIDS activism, had a political project. Today, simply getting together sometimes seems to be enough. Here we might not be too far from an art world version of flash mobs, of people meeting people, as Chiravanisha says, as its own end. This is where I might agree with Jean-Paul Sartre on a bad day, at least in art galleries and art museums, hell is other people. Perhaps discursivity and sociability are foregrounded in art today because they, have, they appear scarce and are rare elsewhere. Here I speak from a, a U.S. perspective. The same goes, perhaps, for the ethical in the everyday. It is though the very idea of community has taken on a utopian inflection in contemporary society. Even our audiences cannot be taken for granted, but must be made up, conjured up at every time. Which might be why contemporary exhibitions often feel like remedial work in socialization, almost a kindergarten for adults, as if artists were saying, come play, talk, learn with me. Yet if participation appears threatened in other spheres of life, its privileging in art might be somewhat compensatory compensation, a pale, part-time substitute. At one point, Virio almost suggests as much. Through little services rendered, the artists fill in the cracks in the social bond, he writes. And only when Virio is most grim is he most accurate, I think. The society of spectacle is followed by the society of extras, where everyone finds the illusion of an interactive democracy in more or less truncated channels of communication. Is art today any different? I'm not sure that it is. For the most part, these artists and curators see discursivity and sociability in benign terms. This tends to draw contradiction out of dialogue and conflict out of democracy. At times, everything seems to be happy interactivity. Among aesthetic objects, Burio accounts, meetings, encounters, events, various types of collaboration between people, games, festivals, and places of conviviality. In a word, all manner of encounter and relational invention. To some readers, such relational aesthetics will sound like a truly final end of art, to be celebrated or condemned. For others, it will seem to aestheticize the nicer procedures of a service economy. Burry also lists invitations, casting sessions, meetings, convivial and user-friendly areas, appointments. There is the further suspicion that for all its discursivity, relational aesthetics might be sucked up into the now general call for a post-critical culture, an art and architecture, cinema and literature that is somehow after theory. <laughs> okay, so much for my, my skeptical survey of relational aesthetics. 
I think there's much here that is important, but it, it's clearly a term that is too elastic. It groups uh, very different work together too hastily. Hirshhorn, for example, is hardly a, a post-critical artist. So in the time remaining to me, I want to twist the term slightly and to rethink it in relation to what I see as a, a quiet paradigm in contemporary art, which I will call the archival impulse. In the first instance, this archival impulse is manifest in a will to make information, historical information sometimes, information that's often lost, marginal, or suppressed, a will to make this information physical and spatial, to reclaim it, to make it public. It is also archival in the sense that the relevant artists develop again the found image, object, and or text. Like any archive, the materials of this art are found but also constructed, public but also private, factual but also fictive, and often they are produced for specific occasions. Often too, this work manifests a kind of archival architecture, the physical complex of information so this project of Hirshhorn in Chicago. Can you have the next slide, please? Again, I'm very sorry that the images are so dark. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So often this work manifests a kind of archival architecture, a physical complex of information, as well as a kind of archival logic, a conceptual matrix of citation and juxtaposition. Indeed, Hirshhorn speaks of this process as one of ramification. And much of this art does branch out like a tree, or rather like a weed or a rhizome, an analogy drawn from the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze that other artists also use today. Perhaps the life of any archive is one of mutation of this sort through connection and disconnection. Laboratory, storage, studio space, yes, Hirshhorn, Hirshhorn has remarked. I want to use these forms in my work to make spaces for the movement and endlessness of thinking. Although Hirshhorn and Gillick, William Gillick, might be more suited to my thesis about the archival impulse, I want to focus here on the English artist Tassa the Dean, an American artist, Sam Durant, who might not be as familiar to you. Dean, Tessa de Dean, <coughs> works in a variety of mediums, in photography, drawing, and sound, but primarily in short films and videos, accompanied by texts that she calls asides. Dean is drawn to people, things, and places that are somehow lost, outmoded, or otherwise sidelined or stranded. Typically, she begins with one such event and traces it as it ramifies into an archive, as if on its own. Take Girl Stowaway, an eight minute film with the narrative aside. Move the next slide. Here, Dean happened on an old photograph of a young stowaway. You see her. This old newspaper article, young stowaway named Jean Jeannie, who in 1928 sneaked onto a ship bound from Australia to England, the ship later wrecked on the Cornish coast. The archive of Girl Stowaway forms as a tissue of coincidences. First, Dean loses the photograph in a bag mishandled at Heathrow Airport. Then, as she researches Jean Genie, she hears echoes of her name everywhere, from the French author Jean Genet to the pop song Jean Genie. When Dean travels to the bay with the ship wrecked, a girl is murdered on the cliffs above the harbor on the very night that Dean also spends there. 
and so on. It's the tissue of coincidences that make up this work. Girls Stowaway is thus an archive that includes the artist as archivist within it. Her voyage was from Australia to England, Dean writes. It had a beginning and an end, and exists as a recorded passage of time. My own journey follows no such linear narrative. It starts at the moment I found the photograph that has meandered ever since through uncharted research into no obvious destination. It has become a passage into history along the lines that divides fact from fiction. And it is more like a journey through an underworld, a chance intervention, an epic encounter than any place I recognize. My story is about coincidence and about what is invited and what is not. This archival work is thus also an allegory of archival work. In another film and text piece, Dean tells the story of another lost and found figure. In 1968, when Donald Crowhurst, a failed businessman from a coastal town in England, hungry for tourist recognition, was driven to enter the Golden Globe race to be the first person to sail solo, nonstop around the world. And neither the sailor nor the boat, the trimaran Christian Tameth Electron, was prepared, and Crowhurst faltered. He faked his, his sea logs for a time, the, the race officials put him in the lead. Then he broke off all radio contact. Soon he began to suffer from time madness with incoherent log entries that amounted to a private discourse on God and the universe. Eventually, Crowhurst jumped overboard with his chronometer just a few hundred miles from the coast of England. Dean treats this event indirectly in three short films. The first two, Disappearance at Sea, one and two, were shot at different lighthouses. In the first film, darkness slowly descends over the sea. In the second film, there is only em emptiness to begin with. In the third film, Tame of Electron, which is the name of the, the boat, Dean travels to Cayman Brock in the Caribbean to document the remains of the boat, of the trimaran. Can you the next slide? Here you can just see it at the, the bottom, near the bottom of the, the image. Go to the next slide. And there it is, today. The boat, Dean writes, has the look of a tank or the carcass of an animal or an exoskeleton left by a creature now extinct. Whichever way it is at odds with its function, forgotten by its generation and abandoned by its time. In this extended work, then, the man Crowhurst is, a, is one term that implicates others in an archive that reveals an ambitious town, a misbegotten race, a metaphysical seasickness, and a mysterious remnant. And Dean lets, lets this archive ramify further. While in Cayman Brock, she finds another derelict structure called the Bubble House. Can the next slide, please? Called the Bubble House by locals. It archives this perfect companion of the tame electron, the boat, in another short film in text. Can the next slide? Designed by a Frenchman jailed for embezzlement, the Bubble House was a vision for, a perf for a perfect hurricane housing egg-shaped and resistant to wind, extravagant and daring, with its cinemascope proportioned windows that looked out to the sea. Never completed and long deserted, it now sits in ruin like a statement from another age. A final example of a failed futuristic vision become an archival object that Dean recovers here in the form of immense acoustic receivers built in concrete on the English coast between 1940 and 
1928 to 1930. Conceived as a warning system of air attack from the comet, these great sound mirrors were doomed from the start. They did not dis discriminate among sounds well enough, and soon they were abandoned in favor of radar technology. So stranded between world wars, the first and the second, in technological modes, the mirrors have begun to erode and subside into the mud. Their demise is now inevitable. In some photographs, they resemble such site-specific sculptures as Tilted Ark by Richard Serra. Indeed, as Dean is interested in the now stranded status of such works, too. She's done two projects on Robert Smithson. And this is a fascination that uh, Sam Durant, an artist that I will discuss in a second, also <coughs> shares. I like these, these strange monoliths that sit in this no place, Dean says, of the sound mirrors, fully aware that no place is the literal meaning of utopia. They also exist in a no time for her. The land around Dutch, Dutch Ines, this is the, the area of this coast in England, always feels old to me, Dean says, a feeling impossible to explain other than it is just unmodern. To me it feels 1970s, the Dickensian, Charles Dickens, prehistoric and Elizabethan, Second World War and futuristic. It just doesn't function in the now. In a sense, all her archival objects, the boat, the team of Electron, the bubble house, and these sound mirrors, serve as arcs of lost time, in which the here and now, the present of the work, functions as a crux between an unfinished past and a reopened future. Again, they are also archival works that are allegories of archival work. Archival work is always incomplete, sometimes litigious, sometimes almost crazy, often melancholic. Paradoxical con connections that disconnect, paradoxical juxtapositions that dislocate, these also inform the work of American artist Sam Durant. Like Dean, he operates with various mediums, drawings, photographs, Xerox collages, sculptures, installations, sound, video. But where Dean is precise about her forms, Durant exploits the theatrical space between them, opened up by minimalist art 40 years ago. Durant remains intrigued by the old debates about sculpture in the expanded field. He has produced work after the critic Rosalind Krauss, as well as the artist Robert Smithson. But he presents this expanded field of art as now entropic, as almost collapsed. Installation art in the imploded field, if you like. I think this is a good description of much contemporary art. Here the next slide. This is a work of his, it's just a diagram. It's, it's a play, almost a parody, on a famous article by Rosalind Krauss that explored this expanded field of sculpture. And you can see that Joanne replaces it with, uh, with some of the, the terms with, with pop figures as well. So too, where Dean is, is meticulous with her network of sources, Duran is eclectic in the sampling of rock and roll history, minimalist and post-minimalist art, 1960s social activism, modern dance, Japanese garden design, mid-century modern design, self-help literature, and so on. All these things appear in his work. Finally, where Dean models her archives as a semi-private collection, Duran imagines his as a semi-political unconscious, whereby repressed materials are invited to erupt. In fact, when his work does, does not trace an entropic collapse of cultural differences, it performs an eruptive return of repressed materials. And sometimes his work suggests 
both operations at the same time. In this regard, the primary object for Durant, who was once a carpenter, is modern architecture of the mid 20th century. He stages a sort of class struggle between the elitism of international style design and the everyday life of the working class. Durant sees such design as, as a prototypical site of repression, and often his response is aggressive. He's made color photographs that show classic chairs of post-war design overturned. The next slide. Prime for humiliation. He's also made sculptures and collages that abuse the case study houses. These are famous mid-century designs produced by architects like Richard Moetra, Pierre Koenig, and Craig Elwood in Southern California after World War II. Next slide. These are his own models. Uh, he calls these abandoned houses. They're made of cardboard, plywood, and plexiglass. And he has burnt them, gouged them, graffitied them, and so on. My models are poorly built, vandalized, and fucked up. This is meant as an allegory for the damage done to architecture simply by occupying it. His nasty collages also suggest eruptions of class spite, of class resentment. In one collage, for example, there are two uh, bankers, two Harley Davidson motorcycle gang members, they suddenly appear in a classic photograph, a pristine photograph of one of these beautiful case study houses. In effect, Durant plums good design almost in a literal sense. He reconnects it to the unruly body in order to unplug its cultural blockages. In different, different works, he's juxtaposed a miniature toilet with a Eames chair, an Ikea shelf, and a minimalist box. In this way, Durant returns bodily functions and unconscious desires to our old machines for living in. This is a troubling of both modern design and minimalist art on the model of Robert Smithson and Gordon Maddock Clark, as well as feminist artists from Eva Hesse to Cornelia Parker. Such a move of counter-repression is also indebted to Mike Kelly. Sam Durant lives in Los Angeles, this is Mike Kelly. And like Kelly, Durant has little faith in cures, but much interest in complications. Durant has also uh, published, I mean, also plumbed, excuse me, also plumbed different aspects of the late 1960s and early 70s. And many artists, I think, in their 30s, early 40s, returned to this, this time, uh, late 60s and early 70s, not only because of the extraordinary art that was produced then, but also uh, the very active politics that were produced then. It's also now, this period is also an historical archive for them. Anyway, he, Durant plums uh, different aspects of this period, advanced art, rock music, civil rights struggles, and so on. Often signs of these things erupt together in the space of his art. In the next slide. In this work, again, you can't see it very well, he refers to both Smithson, who's a Turned tree on top of a mirror. These are both allusions to the work of Smithson. But he also, Durant also alludes to the civil rights uh, struggles of the times as a sign is taken from a, a demonstration. And yet again, as these different signs emerge in the space of his art, they also become entropic. They also begin to collapse. A process that fascinates Durant as much as, as much as it fascinated Smithson. The sculpture is based on partially buried woodshed. This is a work from 1970 by Smithson. In the next slide, please. This is the work by Durant that where he makes a model of this, of this old project, famous project by Smithson that was done on a, a campus, University. Just a way to think about one 
a little part of contemporary art. First thesis. For the most part, the archives in this art are not presented as dead or inert. Again, they tend to ramify like a, kind of a material unconscious of historical connections and disconnections. Once more, this process might reveal how any archive, any store of knowledge, functions. Many of us, critics and historians too, are in the position of the Flaubert characters, Bouvard and Pécuchet, to struggle impossibly to turn old bric-a-brac into coherent systems of knowledge. Second thesis, often this work is a little paranoid, for what is paranoia if not a practice of unlikely connections of private archives put on public display? The question then becomes, to what ends are these paranoid connections made? Do these private archives want to challenge the public ones? Do these perverse orders want to contest, contest the symbolic order at large? Or do they point to a crisis in this general social law? For Freud, the paranoia projects meaning onto a world that appears drained of all meaning. Might archival art emerge out of a similar sense of failure in cultural memory, of a default in productive traditions of all kinds? For why else would one connect so feverishly if things did not seem so disconnected in the first place. Third thesis, the archives in this art are not repositories of finished works so much as platforms of incomplete projects. In this regard, there are places of production, not of post-production at all. We call it Hirshhorn calls his exhibitions construction sites. Here, herein lies perhaps the most extraordinary aspect of archival art, its desire to turn failed visions of the past, as Tessa de Dean calls them, into scenarios, as Liam Gillick calls them, scenarios of other social relations, of alternative futures, in short, to turn the no place of the archive into the no place of utopia. Fourth thesis. Paradoxically, the interest in utopia is sometimes connected to an involvement with the outmoded, the term that Walter Benjamin first introduced in, re in reference to the surrealists. Balzac is the first to speak of the ruins of the bourgeoisie, Benjamin wrote in his Arcades project, but only surrealism exposed them to view. The development of the forces of production reduced the wish symbols of the previous century to rubble even before the monuments representing them had crumbled. The wish symbols in question there were the capitalist wonders of the 19th century bourgeoisie at the height of its confidence, such as the arcades and interiors, the exhibitions and panoramas. These structures fascinated the surrealists nearly a century later when further capitalist development had turned them into residues of a dream world. For the surrealists to haunt these outmoded spaces, according to Benjamin, was to tap the revolutionary energies that were trapped there. The outmoded for archival artists today does not possess the same revolutionary force. In fact, some artists are conflicted about the past that they recover. And yet, even so, there are intimations of hope here, or at least intimations of desire for a different future, future a desire to turn belatedness into becomingness. In any case, there is an unexpected recovery of this once despised aspect of the modernist project, its utopianism so often condemned on the left as well as on the right, as so much will to power, as so much totalitarianism. This deployment of the outmoded might be a weak critique, a weak resistance, but at least it can still question the totalistic assumptions of capitalist culture, never more grand 
the grandiose that today. It can also remind this culture of its own wish symbols, its own abandoned dreams, its own better politics. That's all. Sorry to go on for so long. Thank you for your attention. Culture, according to many people, is a, is a general amnesia. And paradoxically, this is complemented uh, again, this is maybe only from a, a U.S. perspective. But this is complemented paradoxically by a fixation on the past, which might also be, in a funny way, amnesia. For example, uh, American culture, North American culture, is a, a, tra a trauma culture in many ways. And uh, so there's this sort of fixation on history as trauma. So there seems to be an abundance of memory at the same time that there, there seems to be a prevalence of amnesia. I mean, they're nothing but memorials and monuments. And tragically, to my mind, uh, Manhattan is about to have a, a massive trauma memorial. Uh, I think, in a way, with Nietzsche, that we need, we need to learn how to forget, too. This is in a, a different way from the, the, uh, the amnesia produced by mass media. We need, we need to learn to forget and need to learn to imagine, uh, to focus less on the history of the past than the history of the future. What interests me about some of the artists that I mentioned today is that they return to moments, strange moments often, uh, minor moments in the past as a way to open up possibilities in the future. But as to your point about a lack of attention uh, to the actual work of art, uh, I'm in an odd position there. <laughs> I'm very interested in theory, but I also think that the work of art is theoretical in its own terms. And I can certainly attend much more than I did in this, as you say, very general lecture uh, to the work that the work does. But much of the, the work that is grouped under this term relational aesthetics, um, as I suggested, uh, really wants to produce a space of discussion. Uh, so in a funny way, some of the work is not really concerned with its own fabrication's work, it's not a pretext, a condition for discussion. So there, the discursivity is in the work, it's not imposed necessarily by critics. Yo creo que es, empezamos con la otra meseta y a partir de aquí y, y abrimos los comentarios después de las siguientes ponencias, cualquier otro comentario sobre lo de lo de Jaffa para, para entrar ya en tema. Más bien, continuar la entrada. Con tema que. Si ¿Sí? me sube, por favor. 